and welcome to the Scar 9 Magazine vodcast. This month we're going to be talking about the basics of lunar observing. Now when you look at the moon with the naked eye you can see immediately some of the main features of its surface. One of the things you'll notice are the brighter cratered highlands and also the smoother darker regions. These dark regions are known as the lunar seas or maria, but they're actually not seas of water. They're actually huge basaltic lava plains that formed many billions of years ago. Now if you have a good pair of binoculars or a small telescope, you'll immediately see that much of the moon's surface is covered in craters. These range from centimetre sized craters that the Apollo astronauts saw when they landed on the moon, to huge leviathans that are over a hundred kilometres across. For example, the crater Plato is so large that if you were standing at its very centre, you wouldn't actually be aware that you're standing in the middle of a crater, because the walls would be over your horizon. Now the craters that scar much of the moon's surface were caused by ancient asteroid impacts which excavated these huge depressions in the lunar crust. If you have a small telescope and you look closely at some of the craters, you might see some really interesting features. For example, in some craters you might see the terraced walls. This is where material has slumped down after the impact that formed the crater. Now in some craters you might see a central peak. This is a mountain or a group of mountains at the bottom, at the very centre of a crater usually. A central peak is formed when material rebounds upwards during the impact that created the crater. You'll also notice on the moon's surface wonderful mountain ranges like the Apennine mountain range. It's over 600 kilometres in length and even a small telescope will show it in great detail. Another object that you might spot on the lunar surface are rills. Now they come in different types. There's the sinuous rills which are thought to be collapsed lava tubes. And there are straight rills, and these are caused by huge, long, straight faults on the lunar surface. But perhaps the most obvious thing about the moon is that it has phases. The moon's phases occur as the moon orbits the Earth. As the angle between the sun and the moon in our sky changes, the amount of the moon's face that's illuminated from our perspective changes too. So, when the moon sits between the Earth and the sun, it's known as new moon. That's when we can see no moon at all, as it's the other side that we can't see that's lit up. As the moon continues along its orbit around the Earth, the phase grows, or waxes, to first quarter when we see a half moon. Eventually, we reach full moon when the face is fully illuminated on the opposite side of the sky to the sun. Then the amount of the face illuminated begins to shrink, or wane, until we see another half moon, known as last quarter. Several days later, the cycle is completed, as the crescent moon wanes all the way back to new moon. Now you might think that the best time to look at the moon is during full moon, when a lot of it's illuminated, but that's not actually the case. To see some of the real detail in the mountains and the craters, you want to observe it when there's a low angle of illumination. Now I can demonstrate that really easily with this model I've made of the crater Gassendi. You can see that when there's full moon, when the light from the sun is beaming straight down onto the surface, we can't see much detail. But as the angle of illumination changes, we start to see some of the shadows emerge. We can see the shadows in the central peak emerging and some of the crater walls. There's real detail there. And so that's the best time to look at the moon's surface when there's a low angle of illumination on the object that you want to observe. Now another effect you might notice when the moon's low on the horizon, particularly around the time of full moon, is that when it's low down, it appears a lot redder than when it's high up in the sky. Well, we can easily explain that effect using a simple demonstration here. I've basically built a model of our atmosphere. This tank is full of water, and into that water I've dropped a few drops of milk. This powerful torch is going to represent the moon. Now the reason the moon appears redder when it's lower on the horizon is because you're looking through a long section of our atmosphere. And our atmosphere, the gases in our atmosphere, are very good at scattering bluer wavelengths of light. So that what we see uh, reaching us from the full moon when it's low down on the horizon is predominantly red light, redder wavelengths, which is why we see a, an orangey red moon. So here we go, I'm going to demonstrate. We're going to switch the lights off now and we'll actually see this in action. So what we should expect to see is that the particles of milk inside the tank are actually scattering the light from the torch and we should see down this end that the light instead of appearing the white it does now should appear quite orangey. So here we go. If we look down this end now we'll see that the light reaching us from the torch is predominantly red or an orangey red colour just like the low moon on the horizon. 
Now earlier I did say that when it's full moon it's not the best time to observe the moon. But actually there's a type of lunar feature that you can see really well at full moon. And these are the ray ejector systems. These ray systems are material that has been thrown out from the asteroid impacts that created some of the craters on the moon. You can easily see them around full moon with a pair of binoculars. The great crater Tycho is most famous for its ray system, and the ejector from that explosion stretches 1,500 kilometers away from the crater itself. It's thought that one of the reasons why the rays themselves are brighter than the surrounding material is that the impact that creates the crater and the ray systems themselves excavates fresher, brighter material. So I've got a little experiment here in the studio to explain to you how that happens. What I've done is I've filled a baking tray with flour and topped that off with a thin layer of ground coffee. Now the flour underneath is the brighter material, that's going to represent our fresher, brighter material, and on the top the coffee is representing the darker lunar surface. Now I've also got some modelling clay asteroids which I'm going to throw at quite high speed into the surface to see if we can create a ray system. Okay, here we go. Get ready. Fantastic, there we go, look at that. A beautiful ray system coming out from the crater. We've even captured a central peak, there it is. The rebound of material is bounced up to create a central peak. You could argue that we're seeing some terrace walls here, but if you pan out, Kerry, you'll begin to see, look at this material being thrown from the crater in all these lines. And this is what we see on the moon. We see material stretching, in some cases, over a thousand kilometers away from the crater. And this is what we're seeing when we see a ray system form. We're seeing material from that impact thrown across the moon. Well, I hope these little experiments have demonstrated a bit of the science behind what you're seeing when you observe the moon. If you're interested in learning more about what objects to look at on the moon each month, then you can read Sir Patrick Moore's Moonwatch column in every issue of Sky at Night magazine. But from me, that's all. Clear skies, and I'll see you again next month.